Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning, and I, I really do want to lay on your hearts a prayer request that's near and dear to my heart. Um, number four, Wake Forest plays number three, Carolina, today. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, that, that's terribly inappropriate, but still do pray. And uh, let's turn to the 12th chapter of Abraham. I'm so excited to share this message with you um, all week long. Uh, my thoughts have been on you, and particularly those of you who might be in transition, those of you who fall into this unprecedented uh, number here within the last 10 years, last 20 years, really, of people who are without jobs. And that number grows every day right now. Uh, those of you who find yourselves in transitions in others' way, uh, this story of the call of Abraham is for you. It's, it's one that, that rings near and dear to my heart as I approach... Uh, my one-year mark of being with you as as your pastor. So let's read this together, uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 7. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem, At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that in the next few minutes that you will uh, reveal your word in such a powerful way that that those who, who come in contact with it will be transformed by it. That we will have the courage to follow as we hear your call to leave home. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. This is a, this is a message that has so much packed into it, we really could take about seven weeks to, to spend just looking at this passage. And so I encourage you as you read through the Bible, get that secondary resource with you, continue to, to dig deeper because that we can only touch on, on some of the key points of this message. And so I am going to tackle um, this whole seven verses. Uh, we, again, there's so much packed into here. So you have a little note in your uh, a little sheet, I think, in your bulletin that you can write some notes. I encourage you to do so. Our sermons, again, are online, both on audio and video. So if you just want to sit back and, and try to hear it and, 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 and take notes later, that's fine, too. Now, as we talked about last week, in the story of the Bible, and it's important to understand this because the Bible is very long and it's thick and it, and it has a lot of intricacies and a lot of stories and narratives. Remember, there are three levels of narrative. The big picture, the big story, the top level of narrative is the story of redemption. God creates the world good. We ruin it. <laughs> God, uh, God uh, in Christ comes to, to redeem the world through his life, death, and resurrection, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. At the end of the age. This morning, though, we're looking at the foundational story, the really key uh, beginning story of the middle narrative. And remember, the middle narrative is the story of Israel. And it is God's plan of working out salvation in the very real people, real time in history, that leads to uh, the advent of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan in, in Christ. So here we are, Genesis 12, 1 through 7. And God establishes his covenant with Abram. Now, we're going to just call him Abraham, and we're going to call Sarai Sarah, because that's what God eventually renames them, and that's the the language we're familiar with. Um, It's here in this story that for the first time, God makes it clear that there's a plan to make things right. God is not reacting, though. God is not reacting to the fall. It's important to understand That nowhere in the Bible do we get a sense that God has reacted. And this is plan B. It's the plan. There is is a plan of redemption. The story of redemption 
And many uh, scholars will argue as to whether this was always the plan. But we don't get a sense that God is a God that, that reacts or overreacts. But that this is, this is the way that God chose to be God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in revealing who God is and the fact that God's goodness remains and God's providence is intact, we find God entering into history in this covenant relationship with Abram. And it's a, it's a beautiful story. It reveals that all is not lost. God's goodness and providence are alive and well. And it starts with a conversation with a person in a town, in a place, at a particular time. Because any time that God is going to step into history, it always has to be in a conversation with a person in a particular place and time and town. And, and this is where that entry into this covenant relationship with God's people happens in, in this wonderful, hugely important narrative. This is where the road to Bethlehem begins, right here in Genesis 12. In these seven verses, God makes six promises to Abraham. I will show you some land, and then verse 7, I will, I will give this land to your, your uh, descendants. Number two, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. All of the promises begin with, I will. I will do this. In addition to the promises, God gives Abraham two compelling pictures of his future. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then finally, God only requests and demands one thing of Abram. All, all of these things I'm going to do, and here's these compelling pictures of your future, you just do one thing. And we're going to come back to that towards the end. So let's begin with the promises. What are the promises that God makes to Abraham and, 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 and essentially to the world? Number one, God says, I'm going to show you some land, and I'm going to give you this land to your, to your inheritance. Now, Pay attention to the word land, aretz, in the Hebrew. This word, land, is very, very important in the Old Testament. In fact, the word land is found 1,935 times in the Old Testament. That's four times as many uh, references as the word love in the entire Bible. <laughs> Just to give you some perspective. The land is very, very, very important. Land represents wealth and sustenance and food, pasture, safety, the, the, the identity of a people. In verse 7, God says, to your offspring I will give this land. So notice that the promise of this covenant begins not with some uh, intangible, nebulous, figurative, conceptual blessing. It's very, very material, very practical. It's land. It has boundaries. It has geography. Inhabitants, it has to be possessed and occupied and, and fortified against attack. Land needs to be cultivated and, and conserved in order to, uh, to support a great nation. And so since God gifts this land, he gives this land to, to Abram and then to the people of Israel, God's blessings and curses will always from this point forward be measured for uh, basically by how it's going in the land. And you'll find that, you've probably already found that as you're, as you're reading through the Bible this year. We always know how we're doing in terms of how it's going in the land that God has given to us. Every harvest is God's loving provision. Every famine is God's discipline. It was a land that material and spiritual values met in the ordinary work and, and the, the, the routine of daily life. God's gift of land to Israel is at the very heart of the middle narrative. And in the eyes of some, I would think uh, certainly of the eyes of the Israelites then and e even to, to some degree today, the, the promise of God was the land. It, it was very much wrapped up in the land. And so when we look at the news and we see all the violence that's happening around Gaza and this ongoing uh, Israelite-Palestinian battle and then we look further back into history and we see that this piece of land has been fairly contentious for a long time. Understand that there, there, are, there are a group of people, the descendants of Abraham, who feel this land was given to us by God. This is the promise fulfilled. And so there is a lot of emotion, a lot of spiritual intensity that surrounds this land. The truth is, however, that the promise is not bound up in a piece of land. The land was a means to an end. For it was on the land that God would raise up a great nation through Abraham, and from that nation would come the Messiah. 
Now, Abram was already a mature adult. He was 75 years old. Paul says in Romans 4.19 that Abraham was as good as dead. Now, for those of you who might be 75, <laughs> understand that I think Paul's reference was at the point when, when Abraham actually uh, and Sarah have Isaac, and Abraham was actually 100 uh, years old at that time. But nonetheless, the fact that Abraham is, is older and mature, and he is now uh, being promised a son. This, again, is, is a promise. I'm going to make you great. Well, how can you be great if I have no children? You're going to have a child. In fact, your descendants will outnumber the stars. And Abraham is 75 years old. His wife is 65 years old. How can this be? Well, the fact that Abraham is is as good as dead and Sarah is barren, as we learn, works to help uh, God's influence permeate through this story. Because God loves an impossible situation, doesn't he? He loves taking people who are the the least likely that he might prevail through them, that he might be glorified. And we'll find that to be true all throughout the Bible. The situations of human helplessness provide occasions for God's power to be demonstrated and recognized. And then towards the end of 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2, God promises to bless Abraham and make his name great. Now, as Pastor Paul mentioned just a few weeks ago, the Hebrew concept of a name is actually the person's identity. And so God is literally telling Abraham, I'm going to make you great. God is not banking on Abraham's talent. We know nothing about Abraham except who his father was prior to the point of this this chapter, uh, chapter 12, 1 through 7. It doesn't say Abraham was a, a, a righteous man. Abraham was a gifted man. Abraham was anything special at all. God's just decides, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it through you, and I am going to make you great. I am going to bless you. And then God says at the end of verse 2, and you will be a blessing. I don't want you to miss this, because this is a vision of God's future. This is of, of Abraham's future. This is the first one, that you will be a blessing. Now understand that later in the passage, uh, God tells Abraham, and you will be a blessing to all the earth. So this is a different kind of of, of vision for for Abraham's future. I think what he's saying here is, and you will be a blessing to me. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to fulfill my promises in your life. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And as a result of what I'm doing in you, you are going to be a blessing to me. I am going to delight in you. We're going to have fun, you and I, together, you see. And this is a a wonderful vision. What a a powerful vision it would be for your life and for mine to think that because of what God is going to do in our lives, because of his providence, he he chooses us, he he breathes purpose into our lives, he says, I'm going to make you great, I'm going to bless you, and you are going to be a blessing to me. You're going to make me smile. I'm going to delight in you. It's a... It's a bit of a restoration from the fall. You're going to be good once more because of what I'm doing in your life. And then finally God promises in the third verse to bless those who bless Abraham and to curse those who curse Abraham. What does this mean? To sum it up quite simply, it says God is saying I'm going to be for you. And, uh, and Paul takes that in Romans 8 and says, well, if God is for us, then who can be against us? This is a powerful promise that God makes for Abraham. Essentially saying, you know, those people who align themselves with you, who come alongside of you, who support you, they will prosper. They're going to find great blessings in their life because when they support you, they support me. But in the same way, those people who oppose you, and oh, by the way, Abraham, they will oppose you. You will have opposition. You're going to encounter some difficulties. But those people will find that their lives do not prosper. They're going to suffer a consequence of being completely at odds with you because by being at odds with you, they're at odds with me. And their lives are going to take a turn to the degree that maybe they'll change their minds. They'll have a change of heart. This is a powerful promise that, uh, that, that God makes to Abraham. So God concludes with this, this final vision for Abraham's life. As a result of all these promises, everything that God's going to do, he says this. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed 
through you. What is he saying there? He's pointing back to the big story. The big story is happening, the big plan of redemption. And he's pointing back to the big story, and he's pointing forward to the end of the big story, that all of the people of the earth, not just this nation that's going to be great, but every single person who has ever lived will be blessed through you. Why? Because it's through you, it's through your obedience that people will come to know Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of the plan of redemption. You can't possibly know that right now, Abraham. But you need to know that it, this is more than about you, and it's more than, than about the land. It's more than about the great nation that's going to come about. This is going to be the hope of all people, is what I'm beginning in your life right now. That's a powerful, powerful vision. So in light of all that God's going to do in Abraham's life, all these promises, these great visions of, of being a blessing to God and being a blessing to the whole world, God only asks one thing of Abraham. Did you catch it? Leave home. You can't stay where you are. This is not going to happen with you staying where you are. You're going to have to leave home. You're going to have to leave your town, leave your country, go to the place, go to the place that I'm going to show you. You leave where you are, place your trust in my direction, go where I show you, and I will accomplish all of these promises. Stay where you are right now in Haran, in, in, the, in the, your comfortable place that you're comfortable with and used to, and, and, and we're just not going to get this done. You're going to have to leave and go. Now, I want to tell you that this passage hits very, very close to home for me. Because it was just over a year ago that I was sensing God's call upon my life. And uh, I, I knew that I had to go. I had completed what God had prepared for me at First President Hilton Head. And, and I knew that uh, the time had come for me to go to whatever came next. And after some preliminary searching and a few interviews, I, I set up an appointment to meet with a, a friend and mentor, my good, my very good friend, uh, and former senior pastor at Hilton Head, Dr. Bill Rumsey. Some of you remember uh, Bill from my installation service where he preached there. So we were sitting down at McDonald's over a cup of coffee. And I'm just babbling on to Bill about my desire to serve at New Church Development. That's really what I thought I was going to do. And somewhere in the southeast. And when he asked me where I had sent my resume, I told him uh, that since we were you know, family people, and, and we really long to stay close to, to home, that I had uh, sent my resumes only uh, to opportunities that I'd found in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. And I'll never forget that look that he gave me. Uh, it was a look of amusement with a tinge of disgust. <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked me, he said, uh, well, Jim, do you only trust God in three states? Yeah, he nailed me. And so I, I got very defensive. Uh, and I said, look, Bill, you know, Chris and I are very family-oriented people. Family is very important to us. Besides, I could never convince her to move halfway across the country. Like Adam in the garden, I blamed it on the woman. And uh, Bill kind of took that in stride, and he said, oh, you know, I understand, I understand. He said, uh, Jim, let me, let me just ask you one question. Did, did God call Abraham to stick close to home? Or, or did God call Abraham to leave his family, to leave his country and familiar surroundings and to go where God showed him? He quoted Genesis 12, 1 to 7 to me. It was checkmate. You can't argue against that. That's exactly the way that God works. That's the way that God called Abraham. I hate it when I'm wrong. So I went home that day, spent hours looking at every possible position in the country that I could find anywhere. And it was about 4.30 p.m. that afternoon that I sent my resume to Colonial Presbyterian Church. As a result of that conversation in Genesis 12, 1 through 7. This is the way God works. 
And we've, we've talked about this earlier in the fall. We were talking about getting out of the boat. Do you see how Abraham's story is another getting out of the boat story? He was called to leave the familiar and the safe in order to be used by God for extraordinary purposes. As you continue to read Genesis, we learn that Abraham would wait many years to see God's promise of a son become a reality. He, he never settles anywhere again. He just keeps, he keeps moving. And along the way, Abraham makes mistakes. He makes some terrible mistakes. He, he, uh, he lies about his wife. And he has a child with another woman. And then he dies before he ever sees a great nation anywhere on the horizon. But God is faithful. And God does fulfill his promises. And even though Abraham didn't get to see it all come to completion, Abraham is honored by the Apostle Paul and then the writer of Hebrews as one of the most faithful men of, of all of history. Listen to what the, the writer of Hebrews says uh, in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, who, who, called, who was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. You see, God calls us to leave home and live in tents. Don't, don't take me too, uh, you know, concretely there, but figuratively, metaphorically, and spiritually, this is not our home. We need to hold on lightly to the things of this world and to the context in which we live because God keeps us on the move. To live on the road of change, going where he shows us, but dwelling in that place like a stranger in a foreign country, this is what God calls us to as followers. Why? Why does God keep us on the move? Because familiarity breeds idolatry. And that's just the truth. And search your hearts and you know that's right. Routine can become our God. Comfort and peace can become the idols that we worship. Most often throughout the Bible, when, when God wants to accomplish something great in the lives of his people, he sends them packing. Remember how Jesus spoke to those who professed to be disciples, but then made excuses of why they couldn't leave home. Like, well, I have to go back and bury my loved one. And Jesus very, very harshly, and yet speaks the truth in love and says, hey, let the dead bury their dead. What is he saying? He's saying, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to leave everything behind. You're going to have to live like a stranger in a foreign land. You can't go back. I need you to leave home and go to the place where I will show you. Now, I know that there are a growing number of people in our community who are losing jobs. And, and many of you may be here today. Many will hear this message today, I promise you. And, uh, and it's difficult, but I want to encourage you today, each and every one of you, those who have lost jobs, those who think you might, that um, God, God is not done with you. God is aware of your situation. God's promises to Abraham are not unlike his promises to you and to me. Throughout the Bible, God is saying to each of us, and you'll see this over and over again as you read through the Bible, I want to accomplish something great in your life. I want to bless you. I, I desire for you to be a blessing both to me and to other people. O only one thing that I ask of you. Leave your safe, comfortable, predictable country and go to the place that I will show you. Those who are in transition are in a land of new spiritual opportunity. God does great work on the road, in the middle, in between things, when we are desperately crying out to God, where? When? Who? What? How? I was in that place for several months, just over a year ago, at this, this time last year. I, I know very much what it's like to be in a position where you know you cannot stay where you are, but you do not know where you are going. 
And I just want to tell you, that's checkmate for God. That, that is, at the end of the day, where he wants all of us. I cannot stay where I am, but I do not know where I'm going. What is our part? To listen and to pray. And to respond to God's promises with faith. And we must be ready to move wherever he leads us. You know, as a church, that's kind of where we are too, isn't it? We're called to leave home. God has led us to a new vision. One that has us assisting struggling churches, wading into the orphan dilemma in Africa and jumping into, into the urban uh, crises and realities that exist even in our own backyard. These are huge visions. God has called us to, to give it away. And to be honest with you, some of what God has called us to feels as impossible as a 90-year-old woman giving birth to, a, to, to her first son. I, I think God's promises always seem a bit outlandish to the person he's giving them to on the receiving end of this. I'm sure Abraham felt that way at 75 years old saying, you're going to do what? With me? But we, we must remember what the scripture tells us over and over again. And it very specifically, Matthew 19, 26. With man, with you, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Rarely will God ever call us to something that is easily achievable. In fact, God calls us usually uh, in, in this way. He says, I'm going to do these things. And I'm going to do it through you. And now go. Leave home. Get started. I'll show you what you need to know. I'll show you where to go. I'll show you what I want you to do. But for now, pack your bags and go. Get started. Hit the road. And Colonial, that's where we are. We have a vision of God's promise for us, and we're leaving home. But with leaving home comes a sobering realization. We're not going back. I've heard, uh, you know, in these listening sessions over the past uh, uh, couple months that uh, some folks are hitting that panic button, and, and I can understand that. And there, there are some who wish we'd get rid of that simulcast, and let's go back to doing things the way we've done in the past. I've heard and prayed earnestly about comments from people who feel like maybe we should have just split the two sites. And we, maybe we should have tried to sell Warnell so we can complete all the development at Quivira. I've read and prayed about the comments that say our vision would appear to be too ambitious or too expensive. So I, I want you to know I'm listening, and your leaders are listening. And in light of all the options and possibilities, the scriptures are loud and clear on this point. Do you hear it? There is no going back. When God has delivered his promises and he's made his vision clear, our job is to go. And as you continue to read the story about this middle narrative, you'll discover that Abraham and Sarah wandered and traveled and sought to be obedient and go where God showed them for 25 years, 25 years before that child was born. The Israelites who are, who are, who are delivered and liberated from slavery in Egypt wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they cross over into the promised land. It stands to reason that it's going to take us a while, isn't it? to accomplish the vision that God has set before us? Is there uncertainty regarding how we're going to fulfill God's vision for Colonial? Yes, there is. <laughs> we're working very hard, we're listening very hard, and I look forward to sharing a plan with you in the near future, whatever that plan might be. And it's coming together. I'm very, very grateful for many, many people who have committed themselves to prayer and to help in whatever way they can. So yes, there is uncertainty. There's always uncertainty for leaders who have been called to lead a group of people to a place that they've never been. However, we are confident that the vision is clear, and we are confident that God will accomplish his purposes in us and through us as long as we're willing to go. So my question to you is this, you as an individual and you as a church, do you believe in the promises of God? Do you believe that God is good? Then we must respond in faith. And we must go. Pack our bags, hit the road, get started on the journey.
and we must not look back. God will show us the way. Let's pray about that. Lord, this is a powerful story and one that speaks right into our situation individually, as families, and certainly as this family of of Christ here at Colonial. And I pray uh, this morning that we will have the, the confidence in your goodness that when your promises come showering down upon us that, that you want to accomplish great things through us and you will bless us and you are going to be for us that we will simply do the one thing that you've called us to do and that is to pack our bags and leave. To leave behind that which is familiar and comfortable. To resist the idolatry of, of status quo and to simply go where you call us, where you show us, to head on this journey without maps Trusting that, that you will accomplish your promises if we're simply available and willing to go where you show us. But Lord, we need for you to show us the way in every aspect of our lives. We know that we'll make mistakes along the way. We pray for your grace to abound that even through our mistakes, that you will accomplish your perfect will. And your promises will, will come to fruition and the whole world will be blessed through us being faithful to you. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.